you. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you. I have learned a lot from this conference. It is a tough act to come after Michael Ross, who is one of the most significant experts on this subject. But I will try to use the Venezuelan experience to tell you a little bit about some different aspects of the relationship between oil and politics. But I will mention a little bit about what Michael talked about. So. Uh, here you see, the, this is sort of a big picture view of what the history of uh, the economy in Venezuela. Venezuela uh, was the country in Latin America that had the best uh, economic performance uh, for about 50 years between the 1920s and, and, and the late uh, 70s. Uh, and that was the period in which the country was uh, significantly increasing uh, oil production and became the largest, largest exporter of oil in the world in the 1920s. Uh, after that, after the, the, the first price shock, you, you can see that Venezuela uh, started having uh, trouble, and in particular uh, in the 80s and 90s had uh, actually the worst performance in Latin America with the exception of Nicaragua, which was a, a country in, in, in the middle of a civil war. Uh, and that uh, uh, is probably the, 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 the most important reason why Hugo Chavez uh, came into power and the uh, party system that, that Venezuela had, which, which was a, a two-party system that, that lasted for uh, 40 years, uh, collapsed. And that line that you see there is when Chavez gets into power, Chavez, Chavez gets into power actually the week in which the price of oil hit its bottom. So it, it is very symbolic. And he, uh, uh, the first few years of Chavez, uh, uh, in administration, you can see that there is a significant uh, additional decline uh, in, in GDP per capita. Uh, partly in, in the bottom there is because there was the oil strike in which the national oil company uh, uh, had a major uh, strike that collapsed uh, uh, oil uh, production. And then you see the dramatic increase uh, in GDP for uh, uh, a few years that uh, was the, the result of the, of the oil boom. So that's sort of the, the big picture story of what happened in Venezuela. Even, uh, I will focus my presentation on, on the Chavez term, uh, on the Chavez period, but uh, even before that, Venezuela ha had always trouble uh, managing uh, stabilization. It had very pro-cyclical uh, uh, fiscal uh, expenditures. Um, but before the, the oil shocks, since volatility was uh, significantly less and production was always going up, uh, it, it didn't have uh, the, the effects that it had afterwards. So let's talk about, about the Chavez uh, administration. Uh, the performance, as we will see, uh, was very, uh, uh, it was an underperformer compared to, uh, to other countries in the region that had less uh, benefits of a windfall. Let, let's see first sort of some evidence of uh, how good things were for, for President Chavez's term. First, this is the, the terms of trade. You can see that when Chavez came into office, they were close to, to bottom. Uh, and, and of course, uh, this is very similar to what uh, you had in the, in the oil exporters in the, in the Middle East. Uh, but I have to say that, that Venezuela performed uh, a little bit worse than the average uh, uh, oil exporting country in the 80s and, and, and 90s. Uh, here you can see Venezuela compared to uh, other countries in, in Latin America, and you can see that, that there were countries that actually had a negative terms of trade, uh, like Cari Caribbean and, and Central American countries, and among the, the countries that received a, 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 a terms of trade a positive shock, uh, Venezuela was by far the, the most significant. This is uh, an IMF uh, uh, analysis of the size of windfalls as a percentage of GDP. And uh, you can see again Venezuela uh, uh, as a percentage of GDP received about 304% of GDP in this uh, latest uh, windfall, which compared to the size of the Venezuelan economy is equivalent to, to the windfall that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait received. Not, not as in absolute terms. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a percentage of, of the Venezuelan economy. And if you compare that to the previous windfall in, in Latin America, as you can see there in the 75 windfalls were much smaller. So Venezuela couldn't have it 
better. In the history of the region, to put it simply, there, the, no country has received such a, uh, a large windfall. So what happened with that windfall? Well, basically, Venezuela had the lowest growth rate in the region, uh, GDP growth rate, despite the increase that I showed you between 2004 2008, on average, it was the lowest increase uh, of any major country. And if you add all the other smaller countries, uh, Venezuela is just above Haiti and close to, uh, to the next one uh, from, from Central America. In terms of inflation, is by far the, the country with the highest uh, inflation. And, and this is until 2013, doesn't include uh, 2014 and 15, which are the, in which Venezuela has had the highest inflation in the world. If you look at, if you compare a little bit with Chile, which is the second country with the largest windfall, uh, that received the largest windfall in the region, you can see that in Venezuela, real exports actually went down because oil, basically, oil exports went down and other exports went down in, in real terms, uh, uh, whereas uh, uh, imports, of course, because of the increase in the price of oil, uh, they were able to dramatically increase. Con that contrasts with the case of, of Chile, in which both real exports and real imports uh, went up. So Venezuela become, became much more dependent on, on oil, and of, of course partially that, that has to do with the, the significant increase in the price of, of oil, but in, if you even you look in absolute terms, uh, non-oil exports decline and now are about 4% of total exports in Venezuela. And that is true despite the fact that, uh, as you can see there, net oil exports have gone down uh, uh, significantly. But so what is the, the, the origin of the popularity of, of President Hugo Chavez? Well, that period that I showed in which the economy grew and the oil price was going up and income was going up, there were about 5 million Venezuelans who got out of poverty. And that is the period in which President Chavez attained the largest level of, of popularity. If you see here, that mostly was the result of a dramatic increase in uh, consumption, about 60% in cumulative uh, increase in consumption in that period. And there you have an inverted uh, Gini uh, coefficient. You can, uh, I mean, the, the scale is inverted, and you can see that, uh, that the boom in consumption uh, matches pretty well the, the decline in inequality that we experienced in that period, but the increase in production was much less. So this was in the context of a region that in general had the best decade in many, many decades. Latin America, uh, most countries in Latin America reduced uh, significantly poverty and, and uh, uh, some of them uh, also uh, significantly inequality. So Venezuela was not a particularly good performer in the region, but certainly did much better than uh, it was doing in the previous uh, two decades because of the de decline in the price of oil. Not only we received this very significant windfall, but Venezuela multiplied its uh, foreign debt by, uh, until 2013, it was about four times, but if you add uh, some additional debt that, uh, that the country has, uh, 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 loans that the country got from China, it's about five times as, as, as much. And Venezuela had the largest, by far, almost uh, you know, 50% uh, of GDP expenditures in 2012 compared to an average in the region of about 30%. So the country was having fiscal deficits uh, in the middle of the oil boom, very significant this fiscal deficit. In fact, in 2012, the, the deficit of the, of the whole public sector of Venezuela was about 17% of, of GDP when the price of oil was at its average peak in the history of, of the country in real terms. And as you can see afterwards, it has only gotten worse, of course, recently with a decline uh, in the price of, of oil. And in terms of OPEC, countries, if you see today, the, the, the forecast is that Venezuela will have a decline of 10% of GDP, uh, and that's even significantly worse than Libya with uh, uh, the civil war, and of course, uh, much worse than all the other OPEC countries. And in terms of inflation, again, the country is a, 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 a crazy outlier, uh, and we, I mean, we, Venezuela doesn't report inflation anymore since uh, December of last year, but uh, the estimates are, the, are that the inflation is about 109, uh, it's going to be about 190, it could be even, even worse. 
This is the IMF uh, uh, forecast. So what uh, is the explanation for, for, for all this uh, very negative performance? Well, part of it is that Venezuela had a collapse in institutions. If you see there, you, you can see the, the, the World Bank governance indicators all going dramatically uh, uh, down, especially under uh, President Chavez, but even before uh, they were uh, 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 declining because of the political instability in, in the country. Uh, you know, in 2009, and this has not changed significantly, but a little, it's a little bit worse today, Venezuela was only about 2%. To, uh, three percent of the countries in the world in terms of rule of law. I think today is about only about uh, about one percent of the countries in the world. So that must be uh, I don't know a couple of countries. Uh, uh, I think we surpassed Zimbabwe down. Um, so it's 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 a really uh, uh, dramatic collapse in the quality of institutions. Those institutions, of course, include uh, uh, you know Venezuelan con the Venezuelan Constitution established that there is independence of the central bank, but the central bank at this point is the, the president of the central bank has been removed many times uh, at the pleasure of the of the president and all the board and 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 basically uh, the president at some point threatened the central bank that they if they didn't uh, give him part of the foreign exchange reserves to for him to spend uh, he will uh, uh, change the law and basically kick them all out and. So they give, gave him the money. So it was like, you know, like pointing uh, uh, someone with a gun, and and, and he, gave, he gives you the money. So here you can see the electoral uh, budget cycle on asteroids, sort of an extreme version of what uh, we had seen before in Venezuela and we had seen in other countries in the region. That Latin America is a region with procyclicality is also a big problem. But here you can see a, a spectacular increase in real terms of. Uh, 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 of uh, uh, expenditures uh, in the two elections, presidential elections of, the, of uh, 2006 and 2012. And uh, I already mentioned that there is the, 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 the sort of the dramatic, the worsening of the fiscal accounts of Venezuela occurred uh, under the elections. Surprisingly, if you look at the comparison between President Chavez and other presidents in the region, he didn't win by margins that were uh, larger. Uh, I mean, he won by margins that were smaller than all the presidents in Latin America during this period. The presidents in Latin America during, during the last decade were the most popular presidents in the history of the region of recorded uh, polling in the region. And, and President Chavez won by relatively smaller margins. This graph probably is hard to... <laughs> Uh, to see, but you can basically the idea there is that, the, that that's the popularity of President Chavez compared to other major countries in the region, and you can see that he's not uh, uh, actually uh, one of the, the more, most popular presidents. In fact, he, has, he had an average popularity of about 56 percent that in this period in the region wasn't particularly uh, uh, stellar. So how, how is that possible with the largest windfall in, 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 in recorded history in the region? I think part of the reason is, uh, of course, the bad performance that you saw in other uh, indicators. And by the way, I didn't add the crime rates. Venezuela has the second uh, highest crime rate in the world. Uh, but I think part of it was the ideological bent of President Chavez, who wanted to move the country to a very radical position that was not that what the population wanted. So if you see every single poll in Venezuela, it's surprising to see that all the policy positions that President Chavez advocated where a, a significant majority of Venezuelans rejected them. For example, expropriation, bad relationship with the US, bad relationship with the Catholic Church. And you go on and on and you see, well, so why was this president popular? Well, he was popular because he was redistrib or distributing uh, oil rents in, on a massive uh, uh, scale. So that allowed him to, be, to win elections, to be relatively uh, popular, uh, but he spent a lot of his political capital in moving the country to a uh, to the left, uh, to a position that was very far away from the median uh, border in Venezuela. Here you can see again uh, uh, the very close relationship between President Chavez's popularity and uh, the increase in real consumption uh, uh, in the country. So when the price of oil went down uh, and, and, and the government had to cut uh, some expenditures, the, the popularity of President Chavez significantly uh, decline, and here you can see also the very high correlation between his popularity and 
uh, the perception of Venezuelans of how their personal economic conditions were uh, 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 going. This, this slide is just to show you that Ch President Chavez died when we were still in the middle of a consumption boom, uh, uh, engineer for the elections. And uh, 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 so he's still a very popular figure in Venezuela today. Uh, th these numbers were for 2014. Now it's a little bit less. He has about 50% approval rating post-mortem. Uh, but President Maduro has uh, numbers of about 20%. So the, the public still does not, you know, uh, punishes uh, uh, Chavez for, for what we are living today, but, but the, the, his successor. Then the, the perception of the, of the situation in the country, the red line is a negative perception of how the country is, is doing, and you can see that it reached about, about 90% recently. So it is the worst uh, level that this indicator has uh, uh, had. Uh, this is even worse in, in the last uh, couple of months, so uh, it reached 90%. And the popularity of President Maduro has, as I mentioned, declined to, to, to levels of about 20 percent, 24 percent, which are, I think, high compared to, to the other variable because historically it has had a, a very significant correlation, as I as I shown before. So the amazing thing is that all this happens in a country that had this massive opportunity to expand the oil industry, uh, but it didn't. Uh, so, as you probably have heard, Venezuela has the largest reserves of unconventionals. Uh, 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 I mean, there is a significant dispute about the validity of the, uh, the reserve number of Venezuela because it's clearly not calculated in a conservative way because the recovery rates are not as high. But even if you use a conservative number, uh, Venezuela has a, a reserve for about 190 years uh, of oil uh, compared to uh, Canada for, for about 110 and, and, and Iran uh, a, a similar uh, number. That tells you two things. That tells you that Venezuela has a lot of oil, of course, very low quality, extra heavy oil, but that also tells you that Venezuela is not producing enough oil because it's extracting a very low rate uh, of extraction. Here you can see that Venezuela has, has very significant volatility also in the production of oil, and I cannot go into the, the details, but uh, uh, the, the recent decline is, is the one that is the result of uh, basically two uh, main things, or three things. First, uh, uh, when President Chavez uh, fired 20,000 employees of the oil company among the 90% the of, the, of the high management and, and, and uh, technical staff, engineers, etc. The, other, the second one was the expropriation of the, of the IOCs of the international companies uh, operating in, in the country. Uh, they were not fully expropriated. They, some of them uh, left the country, like Exxon and, uh, and Conoco, but the others accepted to be, be become a minority shareholder, but they, they didn't invest anymore in the country. Uh, and, um, and the last one was that the President Chavez basically took as much money from the oil company as he could. And basically, the oil company could not invest during this period of very high uh, prices. And here you can see partly why. Uh, the, the, the red bars are the, the amount that the national oil company invested in, in what they call social and development programs, and the blue line, the amount that it invested on uh, actual uh, oil uh, uh, production in uh, upstream and downstream. And you can also see the dramatic increase in the national oil company's debt, foreign debt, uh, that did not go to uh, investment, but mostly to pay for the uh, social programs of the president. The other, of course, big issue in Venezuela is the issue of subsidies uh, to gasoline. If you think that, that the GCC region has a problem of subsidies, well, Venezuela basically charges one cent per barrel of oil sold in the domestic market. The country that has the, 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 the lowest level uh, after Venezuela is Saudi Arabia with $21 per barrel. Uh, so that tells you a little bit about the, the, the size of the subsidies uh, there. To give you an idea, in terms of gallons, it's 0 0.002, the price of a gallon. Uh, you pay more, you tip more the guy who helps you in the gas station than you actually paid for the gasoline. So uh, uh, it's, it's crazy in terms of the, the, the size of the, of the subsidies. And the reputational legacy of the expropriations mean that Venezuela has the, uh, the, the, is the worst ranking in the, in the Fraser Institute uh, a ranking of, of uh, the oil jurisdictions' attractiveness to invest. So uh, 
the future of Venezuela, it's very bleak. Uh, uh, it, it's the only country, I mean, in the lessons that we heard from, from yesterday, we saw that most countries uh, uh, improved compared to the previous uh, oil shock in terms of their savings and their, and their micromanagement. That wasn't the case in Venezuela. It doubled down on the, uh, on the craziness of the, of, the, of the 70s. Venezuela in the 70s, as I mentioned, afterwards had a very bad performance, partly because it had a very dramatic increase in, in deadness in that period. There is the risk of, 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 of becoming the first oil country in the world with hyperinflation, uh, defined as economists define it as a very high level of like more than 50% per month. Uh, of course, everything depends a, a lot on the, on the price of oil, but things are, are very problematic. There's going to be legislative elections a month from now, in which the opposition will probably win by a significant margin. And I don't want to uh, go into the details about uh, what might happen, but clearly, you know, the, the regime is in very difficult uh, position. I wanted to comment uh, uh, briefly on, on, on Michael's uh, uh, framework on how it, it, it does or does not apply to Venezuela. You know, Venezuela during the, uh, became a democracy in 58. That's what it doesn't appear in his, in his data as uh, it, it is the, probably the country that just two, the, two years before had the highest level of uh, rents per capita and became a democracy. Uh, uh, however, uh, and, uh, Venezuela was considered for a long while sort of an exception to, to this idea because in the middle of the increase in production uh, and, and revenues became a democracy that was pretty successful compared to the rest of the region. However, the, the Chavez period does seem to fit uh, very well with the notion that uh, oil might you know, ge generate uh, powerful executives and, and authoritarianism. Uh, so the Venezuelan case is sort of a mixed uh, uh, case for, for, uh, uh, for, for the theory. In fact, the Venezuelan democratic regime collapsed with the decline in the price of oil in, 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 in many ways. So uh, to, 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 to close, I, I would say that Venezuela shows an extreme version of other issues that we see in, in Latin America, like for example the fact that presidents are very popular when there are commodity booms and that voters do not distinguish between being lucky and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and having good performance. Uh, by the way, that there is evidence that that happens, as Michael mentioned, that even at the subnational level. You know, for example, governors in the U.S. that uh, are governors of oil-rich uh, states uh, benefit also from windfall and are punished when the price of oil goes down. Uh, uh, so, so this is a very general phenomenon. In Venezuela, it's just a little bit... Uh, more exaggerated than, than elsewhere. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, other countries in the region have had significant problems with procyclicality, and those have partly been attributed to the uh, type of democracies that, that Latin America has that are very factional and very populist uh, in many cases. Uh, however, um, Venezuela, again, is a very significant extreme outlier, and other countries in the region, particularly those with mining resources like Peru and Chile, have performed actually pretty well in terms of the macro uh, indicators and, uh, uh, and the macro uh, policy. As you know, uh, Chile has been used here as, uh, systematically as a model. Similarly, that happens in, in, in Latin America. We all have Chile as, a, as a, the big example, but we also have some other countries now in the region that actually manage pretty well the, the, the boom compared to, to the past, uh, including uh, you know, uh, Peru and, and to a certain extent uh, Colombia and even, and even uh, Bolivia. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's easy to extrapolate the lessons for, uh, for this region for, uh, from what happened in, in Venezuela or Latin America, uh, but I think uh, it, it shows how the lack of institutions like independent central banks, like uh, stabilization funds, and, and, but more importantly, as uh, Sami mentioned, the wider political system, the wider political uh, institutions uh, can lead to a disastrous performance on a country that had a lot of opportunities. Thank you.